U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report presents Building Bridges of Communication with Ed Wimmer, Public Relations Director of the National Federation of Independent Business and who is President of Forward America, Covington, Kentucky, and W.W. W. Butch Swaim, Director of NFO Public Information. And now here is Mr. Wimmer. In opening this interview today, I want to ask everyone who is listening in a very important question. Where do you think that our wonderful country will be a few years from now if we fail to halt the liquidation of the family farms, which are now down from 8 million in 1950 to fewer than 3 million in 1969? What about the laughter of the children in the rural school buses, the empty churches, the empty stores and the closed banks that follow the destruction of family farming. This threat, this problem is being confronted at last by our unifying forces who have come to realize that a healthy agriculture and prospering independent businesses are basic to the fulfillment of the American dream, basic to the progress and prosperity of all of the people and especially to our youth, our youth who are asking today is the American dream our dream, our hopes, our future? We have chosen as a title for this interview, Building Bridges of Communication. And what could better symbolize our story than the world-renowned suspension bridge linking the people of North and South, which was built by private enterprise more than 100 years ago? There is a worldwide argument and agreement today that at a time when communications have developed to a point of phenomena, that communications between our youth and their parents, between farmers and businessmen, between the people and their lawmakers, and between nations, needs to be bridged as never before in modern history. I believe this need was made crystal clear at Des Moines, Iowa in December of 1967 when 35,600 embattled farmers, businessmen and independent bankers gathered together under the banners of the National Farmers Organization to gird themselves for a fight for survival. I was the keynote speaker before that vast assembly, the biggest in agricultural history. And when we speak of building a bridge of communication between the people and their lawmakers. I can tell you that hours after the meeting, from President Johnson on down, the talk about liquidating another million family farms was stopped. For many years, our National Federation of Independent Business, the Public Relations Headquarters, has insisted that the battle for freedom, for survival of the family farm and independent enterprise, had to be supported by all groups, by enlightened public opinion, if our American heritage was to survive. And the National Farmers Organization, the NFO as popularly known, was the first great farm organization to see this need. The man behind the Public Information Department of NFO, Mr. W. W. Swaim, is the man who knows the need for building bridges of communications as well as any man in agriculture today. And my first question to him would be right to this point. Mr. Swaim, is NFO winning the fight for fair prices for farm products? Thank Are you. we on the way to farm bargaining for a fair return? Thank you, Mr. Ed Wimmer. Certainly glad to have this opportunity to express my views. And the answer to this is definitely yes. The NFO is now working in 48 of the continental United States, banding together the farmers, in rural America like never before, never before in history. In fact, the farmers in the NFO have stopped going to the marketplace and say, what will you give me? 
the NFO farmers, Ed, are marketing under contracts, contracts with processors, that, with a pricing formula, that are bringing more and more farmers together at a rapid pace. And before too long, I think all America will see that collective bargaining is the only way. And speaking about the Congress and the others waking up, this caused Congressman Okonski to say, farmers, unite or perish. Collective bargaining is the key to the farmer's success. Now, I think this is important, Ed, and this has gone in the congressional records. And as of recent date, over 450,000 copies of this had been requested. Farmers, unite or perish. Collective bargaining is key to the farmer's success. And I'm happy to say that we're well on our way now. Well, our feeling has been for quite some time, and Red Motley, uh, who is a publisher of Parade Magazine, I wrote an editorial about five or six years ago that if all independent enterprises of all kinds, and he warned the doctors at that time that they couldn't win their socialized medicine fight but themselves, that if all independents didn't get together under one banner with one cause, that they would all go down together. Our organization, the National Federation of Independent Business, has 300 men in the field and we make about 3,000 contacts a day. And we think that we know what's going on in the United States from the reports of those men. And when I, when I go across the country in my talks and I come into a place like Fargo, North Dakota, for example, and I pick up the paper and see where they've got 100 farm auctions advertised in the paper that day, you know that that is a frightened community. I was in an area over in Wisconsin where there was 68% of the farms were already gone. And these were not run-down farms. They were the most beautiful farms that we have in the United States. And in Wisconsin, there are 10,000 fewer turkey raisers than there was in 1950. In Butch in, in Iowa, where you have your headquarters there in Corning, the, the fact that 4,500 farms a year have been liquidated in the state of Iowa, most people haven't the slightest idea of what's happening. And when they drove me, when I flew around the state in, the, in a small plane up there making my talks, I didn't want these flyers to have any idea as to what I was doing. So I asked them all, I said, uh, what, what, is, uh, what do you think is, is uh, about our country? What do you think is the main thing that's wrong? And the first pilot said, well, look down, buddy, and you'll be able to see what's wrong with America. Count those empty farms down there. Well, the other two pilots brought up practically the same thing. Now, in talking to young people across the nation today, when you stop to think that one out of every, only one out of every 10 of the farm boys will be left on the farm by 1976, according to figures. We're in a doggone bad way. Now, your organization, of course, in seeking bargaining to get a fair price is no different than our small businessmen. We've been trying for years to stop the use of uh, farm products as loss leaders. We've been trying to stop the use of good names as loss leaders. If we don't get a fair price, we're not gonna have fair profits. If we don't have fair profits and fair prices, we don't have fair wages. So the workers and, and the housewives and, and Congress with its collection, collection of taxes, everybody's involved in this thing. It boils down to this, Ed, that whether it be business or whether it be agriculture, and you can think about this, count that day lost whose setting sun sees the prices shot to glory and the business done for fun. And keep this in mind, I think all of you in the listening audience and all the business people in Main Street should keep this in mind, that the gross income of agriculture is the gear wheel of our economy. Fact is, about 70 million people depend directly on the gross income of agriculture. And the farm dollar, the gross farm dollar, turns about seven times or multiplies about seven times in our economy. And at least three to four times right in the local county before it leaves, Ed. So it's everybody's problem, not just the farmers. Well, the thing that, uh, that I felt that was missing in this whole farm picture all these years is that whenever you read anything about farmers, it was a battle for parities, it was a battle for subsidies or against subsidies, for soil banks, or for uh, fair returns and so on and various types of protection. Until we had this big meeting in Des Moines with those 35,000 people there, it didn't seem that the real, the real uh, thing that we had to get across to the people was the fact that when you liquidate the family farm, you liquidate the towns and you drive all of these people to the cities, and furthermore, every single individual that is running something of his own is a unit of a free society. 
Now, when I brought out to those people up there that it was right for them to want new tractors, it was right for them to want money to put away in the bank for their old age, that it was right to want to send their children to better schools and colleges. But if this was all that they were seeking, if they couldn't prove that without them, there's no free enterprise system, no American heritage, no representative form of government as we know today, see, they didn't have a leg to stand on because this talk of survival of the fittest is, is gaining so much ground and all this efficiency with these big corporate farms and everything, which are not efficient at all. In fact, out of, uh, I think out of uh, 1,500 of them, something like 1,500, only a very few paid any income tax, and on the average, there's only one and seven-tenths percent income tax. This thing, if this, this relation of efficiency with bigness, instead of people asking the question, what shall it be, survival of the fittest or survival of that which is fit to survive? Now, we lose our family fine, we lose our small business, we lose our local financial institution, we're going to lose America. Well, I don't think that if uh, the NFO didn't have something else as a goal besides higher farm prices, I'm like you, I think it would fall out on its face and go out of existence tomorrow. But we in the NFO, we realize, and many of our people are fighting not for the family farm alone, but for private enterprise as such, for America as a whole, because Senator Capper put it, the purpose of the capper valsted Act is to give the farmer the same legal right to bargain collectively that's already enjoyed by corporations. In other words, it gives the farmers the right to become better businessmen, to use better business methods. And our philosophy, Ed, in the NFO is get acquainted with your neighbor. You might like him. And I think this is real philosophy. We have the small businessman at heart and free enterprises as such, not to let it develop into giant corporations or giant uh, enterprises that will monopolize the whole thing and take over America so that we end up one day with maybe one automobile company, one newspaper, and the government then has to run the whole thing. This is what we're fighting for. The thing that, uh, that I believe that where the, where the uh, average person in our country today, and particularly the average businessman and the average farmer, there's always been a breach between the family farm and small business. The, the small businessman was mad at the farmer because he sent his money off to Chicago to the mail order houses and the, the, uh, the farmer said that the small businessman was charging more and all this sort of thing and they had a sort of a hate line between them and there was no communications and the banker back in the days I can remember when a lot of the local bankers were looking for these farms to lose money and go broke so because they were trying to get one for their doctor friend or the dentist or somebody today the bankers association this, this independent bankers association of America sounds more like a farmers than it does a bankers organization their men are out making speeches all over the country to um, talk to the people about saving the family farm. Why? Well, I saw a headline, and you saw it too, I think, in this hotliner that this fellow puts out, where banks for sale cheap. Now, it took the banker a long time to wake up to what was happening. It's taken the people a long time. And this, commu this br breakdown of communications between the farmer and the, and the working man, between the working man and the small businessman, if we can't build these bridges between these various groups, Take the, the, the labor union, for example. Every single time a new contract comes up, more fringe benefits. They, they want more of this, more of that, more security, longer vacations with pay, but they don't stop to think that this thing has got to come from profits. Now, when we brought this labor and agriculture and business idea together through the NFO and through our organization, I believe we started building a new type of bridge of communications, which without a question of doubt is going to be the answer to this thing because we all agree we can't win alone. Well, the bridges are being strengthened now, Ed, and they're being building, building real fast. The change has come about so terrific that you wouldn't believe it, what it was even just maybe 30 days ago. This thing is changing so rapidly. The public is waking up to the fact that we must put a price on raw materials, the things that come from nature, what God gave us or placed here for us or however they got here, we must put a price on those raw materials that will balance with wages and interest costs, our cost factors of doing business. Or it's another way of saying cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And everybody must have a profit. We realize this in the NFO, and we realize that it must start with farmers. We realize that the Main Street business people uh, are waking up like they've never been before. And I think that it's possibly a whole lot to do with your organization and your efforts, Ed. Didn't you tell me that it was 270,000 
business people that belong to your organization? Well, of course, it's changing so fast with 300 men a day. It's like your own organization. I, you, you don't tell how many you've got. But I'll bet you that if it came to a real showdown, if, if I can judge by the enthusiasm of these NFO guys that I run into all over the country, you must have more than any other, orga any other farm organization right now. But I'm not going to put you on the spot on that. But our organization with 270,000 members, when we go to bat with, for the grocer, we're speaking with the voice of the doctor and the barber, and we're speaking with the voice of the meat packer and factories and every type of professional man, because when you go in there and lay something down in front of that congressman and you're a hardware man and you're looking for something for the hardware business, well, they expect you to be looking for something selfish. But when you're representing farmers and businessmen and professional men and newspapers and radio stations, I don't know how many radio and television stations we've got in our organization all over the country. Now, with this kind of communication developing, the Congress is getting more respect for what's going on out there in the sticks. And furthermore, Appalachia's broke down. The Great Society programs are broke down. The, the, there's no communications on the civil rights, really, none. We haven't really developed any communications. We haven't developed any co communications in this urban renewal thing, correct, that what, what is needed. Now that they're beginning to recognize all the failure of all of these things because they have been treating effects instead of causes. All the way down the line is all we're getting. You got a good one on that treating effects. I, I think that what we've really been doing to agriculture and to a lot of these other programs that we've had, it's like treating the sore toe, and the treatment that they've had is to cut off the leg. And then, furthermore, they've been charging the taxpayer with the amputation bill, with the operation bill. And this is a disgrace, because it must come in the marketplace, Ed. If we're going to get the trade turn of the farm dollar, it must come in the marketplace. And what we've been doing is making use of the Capra Valset Act, of course, Collective Bargaining for Agriculture. We've been telling our story through radio and television. Right now we have something like 75 uh, TV stations throughout America with more going on every day. Many of these are the public service. We have over 750 radio programs each and every week telling rural America's story, not just the farm story, but we're telling stories like this, the small businessman story. Mm -hmm. We have bankers on, we have church leaders, and the great leaders of the nation, just like yourself. You've been at it for 35 years now. I'd heard of you for 20 years before I finally met you, Ed. And the great job that you've done in your organization, and the great job uh, that has been carried on. And I know our, our national president, Mr. Orrin Lee Staley, has done a great job uh, for farmers, and he appreciates. And he wanted me to send uh, his respect and his thanks to you and your organization for what you had done. The thing that I believe that we've got to concentrate on from now on is this student challenge. Uh, I talk to students all over the country, and uh, I find a, a great antagonism among the boys. The girls are always willing to listen. They're just absolutely wonderful. They want you to make good, and you can just see the charm of these kids today is, is so great. And the young fellows have got their, their pads out and their, and their pencils, and they're ready to challenge you on everything. But when you take them through the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and, the, and I take them through the Sermon on the Mount to a certain extent, extent, and the Declaration of Independence, as to what this country was built on, and then take them through the Chicago Fire and the San Francisco Earthquake and show them that those two great cities rose out of those ashes and out of those cracks with, a, with absolutely no person looking to the federal government for a dime, and every for rent sign and every empty store was a challenge for some young person to strike out on their own. Now, it took a long time to get this story across, we've been going into 30,000 schools and colleges every month for the last year. And I'll tell you, the reaction of these boys and girls is something to thrill anybody if they could see what these kids really need. They're against the Vietnam War. They're against the establishment. They're against authority. They're against all of this bigness and labor, business and government. But they have nothing to be for. And when you take them out there and give them something that they can sink their teeth in, and show them how this country was built on individual enterprise and individual initiative and self-reliance. And the family farm is the basis to the whole thing. And yet all we heard all those years, liquidate another 500,000 family farms. And, and it's this laughter of these kids in these buses and the, and the church pews and the empty stores on Main Street is what we're creating with talk of this kind and carrying it out. Well, just to show you how it's changing, Ed, uh, just recently, we had two college professors brought a busload of their students to Corning, Iowa. They went through our national headquarters and then they spent the day going to school there on collective bargaining for agriculture. And not 
just what it would mean to the farmer, but what it would mean to America that it would put revitalization back out here in the Main Street stores, would put money in the pockets of everybody, and would solve many of the poverty programs and the other things. Why put it on the taxpayers' back, put it in the economy, a price on the raw mm -hmm. materials, and let it generate income mm -hmm. to take care and solve all these problems? Because if you solve them together by working together, then there's something in this for everybody. The thing that I would like to have the, the people out here in our audience realize, that if the farmer had been getting his fair share of the consumer's dollar, if all this money hadn't been maybe going into games and contests and trading stamps, if he'd have got one more cent on a loaf of bread, he'd have had a, what is it, a 50% increase in, in, this would in his price of wheat. He only gets two pennies now out of a loaf of bread, yes. less than two pennies. If he got one more penny, he'd have a, a, an increase of, of 50%. Now, I had a haircut the other day, cost me $2 and a half. I don't resent paying this $2 and a half for the haircut, but I do get scared when I think that that represents two bushels of wheat right. at today's prices. Now, two bushels if, of wheat and nearly three bushels of corn. Yeah. Now, if the consumer can understand this farm question through NFO, through our organization, through everything's done, that if they were getting their fair share, the farmer would, that $7 of every $1 that, this go that goes to the farmer, goes, that $7 more goes into the bloodstream of America, and that we won't be piling these kids in these cities from these farms, that we'll have a healthy agric agriculture, and only on a healthy agriculture are we ever going to build a healthy, prosperous country. It can't be done any other way. And people that don't, don't want to pay a fair price for what they buy and a fair profit don't deserve a fair wage. I'd like to make it clear, Ed, that the price of groceries would not need to go up at all if the farmer just got his fair share of the food dollar, that there wouldn't need to be an increase in the price of groceries. I'm not saying that the, maybe the grocer wouldn't put a price increase on it, the big chain stores, but I'm saying that if the farmer just received his share, think of it folks, you're paying a quarter for a loaf of bread, and the farmer that produces it gets less than two pennies. This is the story, and the public doesn't realize these things. Now we're going to find out a great deal of this, and we're going to end much of this. The, as you know, there's been more talk in the last six weeks about finding out what the big consolidations and the big combines and the big chains have been doing to rigging the prices of farm products throughout the United States. They've been used in loss leaders, farm products as loss leaders for the last 40 years. Now this has got to be brought to a stop and I believe it is going to be brought to a stop and I'm surprised as to how far the new administration has gone to dig into these uh, big giants already as Eisenhower recommended way back in 1950. Well, the big monopolies are now being accused by the Congress, the United States, for rigging the markets. And of course, we've realized some of these things for quite a long while. But I think it's moving fast now. The public is waking up. They're realizing that something has to be done. And this is why we get people, Mr. Wimmer, our national headquarters from all over the world. Just right recently, we had a group of economists from Brazil and Corning, Iowa, little old Corning, Iowa, 2,500 people was the only spot in America less than 50,000 or more up, maybe to a, more like 100,000 that they even stopped at. And this is right out there in the middle of nowhere because they realize that the true economic conditions of America, the true gear wheel, comes from the price on raw material. Mm -hmm. And in the next 30 years, I'd like to make it plain why they're going to solve this problem, in my opinion. The next 30 years in America, we're going to have to duplicate uh, everything in the way of houses. To try to keep their spark plugs from being used as loss leaders. The Fisher Pen Company, Motorola says without the independent there'll be no Motorola. Now to me this is a, this is a tremendous growth of sentiment. And I don't know where in the world that we could, we could find anything that is a greater demonstration of a man's patriotism than this uh, Knott's Berry Farm. Uh, Walter Knott's 75 years old and, he, and his wife is 75 years old and they have just just completed the, a complete and total duplication right to the brick and to the little chips in the block that holds the Liberty Bell of a de Declaration of Independence Hall and Heritage Hall at Knott's Berry Farm. Now Mr. Knott says this, of all the little children of all races and all colors that will never get to visit Independence Hall that live on the West Coast. And so he has duplicated this thing so that these young children can come to this Independence Hall and get a, a taste of, of America. Right. Now, for heaven's sake, if one man will do all of this, why should any farmer hold back or any independent businessman or professional man in helping to save this system? 
I'd like to point out what one professor, the University of Missouri, has to say. Dr. V. James Rhodes says, Farmers must unite if they want anything to say about the future organization of American agriculture. And there's not much time left. If farmers want to organize and bargain as a group, they can do so. Agriculture leadership has a relative short time to get this job done. Otherwise, within our lifetime, the individualistic structure will be gone. Now, Ed, I know you have something to cover here. Uh, this picture of the signing of the Declaration <coughs> of Independence. Let's get into that. We're about out of time. Well, uh, you know, we talked about building bridges, and probably Benjamin Franklin is as respected as anybody ever was. And Ben said that without the free communication of ideas, there can be no spread of wisdom, no elevation of man, no real freedom, and no peace. And I think we're seeing in this Vietnam arrangement no communications, Russia and America's relations. And I want to read something from a newspaper of Philadelphia. It was on July the 4th, 1776. Editorial comment here is limited, but one report attracted the attention of commentators. It says, America will become, with the blessings of the Almighty, great among the nations of the earth. It is not permitted in the limited space reserved for this dispatch to engage in speculation. The troops blooded at Bunker Hill and Lexington a year ago face a long struggle. It is also very risky, for as Mr. Franklin was heard to observe, the gentlemen of Congress would have to hang together or they would hang separately. In any case, the deed is done. If true independence should come, America will have great responsibilities thrust upon her. How will the generations succeeding to these responsibilities preserve freedom and deserve its blessings? This to me, ladies and gentlemen, from July the 4th, 1776, is something for us to think about today. Well, Ed, the farmers have three choices. Either organize and bargain for a fair price, or turn ownership of agriculture over completely to huge corporations, or let huge corporations control agriculture through integration. What is your choice? We're calling on all of you to join with us and solve the problem now. U.S. Farm Report has presented Building Bridges of Communication with Ed Wimmer, Public Relations Director of the National Federation of Independent Business and who is President of Forward America Incorporated, Covington, Kentucky, and Butch Swain, Director of NFO Public Information. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at the same time for more facts on agriculture and rural America which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's true prosperity level, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers. A brighter day for American agriculture means a brighter day for Americans everywhere.